Ο Γκριαμ Χάρμαν είναι καθηγητή αυτή τη στιγμή στο Southern California Institute of Architecture. Ε, είναι ιδιαίτερα σημαντικό στοχαστή γιατί με τι εργασίε του στην πυροτική φιλοσοφία έχει δώσει μια νέα πνοή ε, στο τοπίο τη φιλοσοφία γενικότερα. Έχει εργαστεί ε, πάνω σε έργα του, έχει σχολιάσει και έχει γράψει βιβλία πάνω σε έργα του Μεριασού, του Χάιντιγκε, του Βίνο Λατούρ. Ε, Δίνοντά μα πολύ πρωτότυπε αναγνώσει πάνω σε αυτού του φιλοσόφου και ο ίδιο έχει εισηγηθεί ε, ενό καινούριου φιλοσοφικού ρεύματο που καλείται Object Oriented Ontology, ε, για το οποίο θα μα μιλήσει και απόψε. Ο τίτλο τη ομιλία του, Realism in Contemporary Continental Philosophy, ε, The Words and Object Oriented Ontology. Dear professors, students and colleagues, um, my name is Maria Thanasia Bitsara. I am a student in the History and Philosophy Department of the National University of Athens. I'm also a member of the organizing committee of this conference. I'm extremely honored uh, to be here tonight and uh, have the chance to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, Professor Graham Harman. Graham Harman is a distinguished uh, professor of philosophy at uh, the Southern California Institute of Architecture. Very happy to have him tonight. Uh, as a keynote lecturer, uh, since he's one of the um, uh, key figures to have initiated um, the new uh, trend in philosophy called speculative realism. Uh, his works uh, on Heidegger, Quandam Yasu, and um, Bruno Latour have been quite refreshing for uh, contemporary continental philosophy. Um, he also seems to be a very fascinating individual. <laughs> Uh, without further ado, uh, let's welcome him. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Can you hear me? No? Oh, it's not on. Now it's on. Can you hear me now? Fine? I've been here twice before as a tourist in Greece. This is my first time lecturing in Greece, and it's an honor, of course, to speak in the homeland of philosophy. And I will promise to try not to speak too quickly, because uh, I know your English is excellent, but even native speakers of English often complain that I speak too quickly, including my mother. <laughs> I sometimes speak too fast for my mother, so I will try to not go too quickly here. I'm going to talk about object-oriented ontology tonight, and you might be familiar with object-oriented programming in the computer sciences, and I did, I stole the name from them, but I wasn't inspired by it directly. I do not know a lot about object-oriented programming. I just wanted a kind of object-oriented philosophy because it seems to me that most Western philosophy has been anti-object-oriented, anti-object-oriented. And there are two different ways that objects can be destroyed by philosophers. But I, first I will start by asking about knowledge. What is it we mean by knowledge? Big question. Uh, I would answer this by saying that there are two basic kinds of knowledge. If somebody asks you what something is, you can give two kinds of answers. One is you can tell them what it's made of. The other is you can tell them what it does. And these are two forms of reduction. One of them reduces a thing downward to its parts or pieces. The other reduces it upward to its effects or its participation in events. So you could say, for example, I don't know how well known Eddington's metaphor of the two tables is, probably a lot because this is a philosophy of science department. Eddington, of course, the great English physicist who, uh, among other things, verified Einstein's general relativity in 1919. Eddington also wrote his famous Gifford lectures beginning with the metaphor of the two tables. He began by saying, I'm, I'm sitting down to write my, write my lectures at this table, but it's actually two tables, not one. One of the tables is the one that's uh, the practical table that's hard, that I can lean on, that has a certain color, a certain price, is in relation to certain other objects. That's one table. The other table is the one that's mostly empty space and it's made of subatomic particles, the table that scientists study. And of course, that, this difference survives in something like Wilfred Seller's distinction between the scientific and the manifest images. I have made the case that neither of these is the real table. Eddington's first and second table and, and Seller's manifest and scientific image are not, neither of those is the real table. The, the table, the real table is a table that is not of knowledge. It's a table that cannot be known in either of those directions. 
And to be object-oriented, we have to be anti-knowledge to a certain extent. And that may lead to problems, but we have to assert a kind of cognition that exists alongside knowledge without being a kind of knowledge. And my thesis is that philosophy is one such kind of cognition as are the arts and architecture and design. And so philosophy, uh, despite 400 years of trying to become more scientific, philosophy is not a kind of knowledge. And the arts, I think, are more obviously not a kind of knowledge. And I'll explain tonight why I think that is. So let's talk about reducing a thing downward to its components. This is what object-oriented ontology calls undermining. And you might know the word. It's a real English word. Undermining is when you dig under a thing to make it collapse. So if you're if your enemy in a war has a position, you dig a tunnel under them and it collapses. Right? That's undermining. A real English word. And so when we speak of the undermining of objects, we can go all the way back to the birth of Western philosophy right here among the pre-Socratics, who were all trying to find the basic element of which everything is built. So we begin with Thales of Miletus, a place I've been lucky to visit several times. Uh, the first principle, the arche of everything is water. And then from there, Anaximenes saying that the first principle is air, and Pedicles, air, earth, fire, and water, joined by love, separated by hate. I'm sure you know all of these because it happened here. Uh, the atomists, uh, atoms swerving through the voids. That's one kind of pre-Socratic philosopher. And as Aristotle pointed out, there's the second kind. The second kind say that even these physical elements are too specific to be the root of everything. And so you need the aperon, this boundless, this limitless, infinite thing that doesn't have any definite shape or form, but from which all the forms emerge and into which they pass. What these philosophers all have in common, though, is the idea that what we're looking for is something deeper than objects, that middle-sized everyday objects are not really there. They're decomposable into something more basic. And of course, we get a lot of this in the physical sciences today. We get a lot of this in even continental philosophers, such as Levinas, when he talks about the Ilia. When you have insomnia, you experience being as this indefinite, Ilya, there's a there is that you cannot shut down because you can't fall asleep and it doesn't have any definite parts and you can, only the human mind carves it into parts. Or you get something like this in Bergson where it's only the human mind and its practical needs that cut things into parts. There aren't really objects in the world. All of these are forms of undermining, undermining objects. So why can't we have a theory like this? What is wrong with having an undermining theory that says that it's, there's something more basic than objects? The problem is that this, theory, this kind of theory cannot account for emergence, what we call emergence, and I believe in emergence. Uh, not that emergence is unpredictable, as it means for some people, but simply that if something emerges beyond its parts, then it exists regardless of any changes in those parts. So within certain limits, uh, there's that old story, I don't know if it's an urban myth or not, that the atoms in your body are being replenished about every seven years on average. So if that's true, then none of these atoms were here in 2009. They were in food or in grass or something. And I've, all those atoms are gone. These are new atoms that came from plants and other food sources. Uh, but you would still call me the same person in some sense. It wouldn't be ridiculous to call me the same person. I would argue that I am. So there's something about me as an object over and above the pieces. Uh, the city of Athens has gone through great changes since uh, the Fifth, fourth, uh, fifth and fourth century BCs that we visited this afternoon, the Agora, the ancient Greek Agora, the Temple of Hephaestus. Uh, obviously, it's a different city in some ways. Many cultural changes, many physical changes, much larger city. But it makes sense to still call it Athens in some way. We can debate about what the criteria are. Uh, but we would say that Athens is something over and above those pieces, many of which have changed. And no one is here who was here 150 years ago. Those people are gone. We will presumably be gone at some point and replaced by others. The city could still be here. So undermining objects does not work uh, because you cannot account for a thing by simply decomposing it into parts. The uh, other kind of reduction, which is the upward reduction, is more common in the modern period of philosophy, which is where you say, the underminers say objects are, are too shallow to be true. You have to go deeper to find the parts they're made of. That's what's real. Ultimately down to quarks and electrons or down to strings or down to whatever the smallest piece of physical matter is. Whereas the, the other reduction, which I call overmining, and I invented that word. I had to invent that word. And you can do this in English. Undermining is a real word. Change it into overmining. My French translator had a heck of a time with this. They had to invent construction metaphors because you can't do it with mining in French. Um, we'll see if it ever gets into Greek what, what, you, what your solution will have to be. Uh, overmining is when you say objects are too deep to be real. Who needs this idea of objects? Everything is 
the product of language or culturally constructed or everything is the result of power or there are no things, there are only events, right? Everything happens only in one time and one place. My favorite overmining philosopher is actually my favorite living philosopher, Bruno Latour. Bruno Latour tells us that there are no things hidden behind the actions. A thing is its actions. This is actor network theory in the social sciences. Latour says in his book, Pandora's Hope, an actor, which is his name for an object, an actor is whatever it transforms, modifies, perturbs, or creates. A thing is what it does. American pragmatism is one of the roots of this idea of Latour's, and Alfred North Whitehead's philosophy is another root. Uh, what's the problem with this kind of theory? Well, Aristotle already told us in the metaphysics when he was arguing against the Megarians from Megara close to here, when the Megarians were saying someone is a house builder only if they're building a house right now. You can't be a house builder if you're not building a house right now. You are only what you actually are. And why did Aristotle have to introduce his notion of dunamis or potentiality? It's because Obviously, there could be a master house builder who's asleep right now. And they're more of a house builder than I am, even though neither of us is building a house right now. You could say this person is in a sense that I'm not. He has the potentiality in a way that I don't. So in other words, it's very hard for overminers to explain change. If there's no object deeper than its current actions, if there's no me deeper than what I'm doing right now, a surplus, an excess in me right now, how can I be doing something different a week from now, a year from now, two years from now? I am not just my current actions. That would be the object-oriented critique of overmining. So you see there's problems with both of those. And actually, these two theories usually come as a pair. And I needed a name for this. And the first name I thought of was duo mining. And so I Googled it because I don't like inventing crazy new words. I hate neologisms. And so I, I wanted, I was hoping someone had already used the word duo mining. And they have. And it's used in the credit card industry to mean data mining and text mining somebody simultaneously to get all the information you can about them. So it's a very nice, sinister dark words, uh, which is what I wanted. So dual mining is when you, when you get rid of the, of both of the, uh, uh, you get rid of the object in both directions at once. You reduce it to its parts and you reduce it to its effects. And there, I can give lots of examples of this, but one example is Ray Brassier, with whom I used to work in speculative realism, and we had kind of a falling out and don't get along well now, but uh, he was making this case in his book Nihil and Bounds that the self is actually two different things, neither of which is the self. The self is subpersonal neurocomputational processes, so it's the neurons firing in different patterns. And the self is also its social function, right? It's its ability to get along and get things done in society. So you have the self down here and the self up here. Where's the self in between? It's not really there. It's a myth. You've got the, the pieces and you've got the effects. You have nothing in between. And this is what I want to avoid. This is what the way that theories try to get rid of objects. No, uh, I don't want to say that philosophers have always been against objects. First of all, there's Socrates. Socrates favors philosophia. It's a love of wisdom, as you know, in Greece. It's a love of wisdom. It's not a wisdom. It's something you can never get to. And that's what the object is for me. It's that which is in between its components and its effects. It's a thing in between that you can never get at directly. And just as Socrates never successfully defines anything in any of Plato's dialogues. Uh, and this is what's forgotten when we try to turn philosophy into a knowledge in the modern period. We try to turn it into a science. Philosophy cannot be a science any more than arts can be a science. And I will argue that shortly. So uh, that's one moment. Another moment is Aristotle's primary substance, uh, where a thing is deeper than any of its visible properties, and where a thing is not made up of atomic substructure, because there are no atoms for Aristotle, of course. The substance is something in between those two levels. You've got, uh, well, what's the problem with that, that tradition? That tradition continues up and through Leibniz. And you see in Leibniz especially, there's too radical a difference between things that are natural and things that are merely aggregates. So Leibniz can talk about a cat or a flower. He cannot really talk about airplanes or computers, even though for me, airplanes and computers count as objects. Nature is not a criterion for objects. Why not? Most people, if you ask them what an object is, will say, it's something hard and durable and physical and solid that can be moved around. For object-oriented ontology, or triple O, as we abbreviate it, O-O-O, triple O, an object is simply that which cannot be reduced exhaustively in either direction. An object is that which is not reducible to its pieces or to its effects. As soon as you have something like that that has a life of its own, like Athens, or like myself, or like any reasonable object you can conceive of, you have a, a real object. 
what would not count as a real object? Something that exists only because of a unified effect that it has. So if you name six random objects, or there's a Sherlock Holmes story called The Red-Headed League, where they pretend that there's this giant club made up of red-headed people. And it's only, it's a trick designed to trick somebody into being away from home so they can rob him. Uh, that's not a real object. That's something they use in order to deceive the man. It's not a real object. Uh, an object is that which exists regardless of its components or its effects. That's all that it means for us. So we conclude fictional entities. This is why we call Triple O a flat ontology, right? There are uh, Popeye, uh, Mickey Mouse, unicorns, this bottle, the city of Athens, the Greek flag. All of these things exist as objects. Okay, so that's the first step, is that we have uh, this object that cannot be reduced in either direction. And I've said Socrates and Aristotle both give us a taste of what an object-oriented philosophy would look like. Immanuel Kant is another, because Immanuel Kant talks about the thing in itself, the Ding an sich. And although Kant is extremely influential, obviously, the most influential modern philosopher, no one seems to like his thing in itself. Everyone has succeeded by denouncing it, starting with the German idealists. That it's nonsense to talk about a thing outside itself because that's already, thing, sorry, a thing in itself outside thoughts because that's already a thought, therefore you're contradicting yourself. You're all familiar with this argument. Um, there's one passage where Heidegger defends the thing in itself in Kant and the Problem of Metaphysics, but that, even that is, he doesn't dwell on it very long. I'm an ardent defender of the thing in itself. I think you cannot have a sense of philosophy without the thing in itself, because if you did, you would have to have some concept of a direct access to objects, which for me would be impossible, because that would be a form of overmining. The idea that a thing can be replaced by the way we access it in knowledge or in perception. The object is actually deeper than any knowledge or perception. So it is a thing in itself. You can never get to it. Now, what do I, why do I not just the Kantian then? Why do I go on, off on this other direction? Well, because there's a problem with Kant, which is that the thing in itself is simply something that eludes human beings. It's all about humans. We poor humans are finite. We live in space and time, and according to 12 categories of the understanding, and we cannot reach the thing in itself. What about objects in their dealings with each other? This is not something Kant talks about. He thinks we can't talk about it. Because if I want to talk about two billiard balls colliding apart from me, well, they're already colliding for me, and therefore they're subjected to the categories of the human mind. I don't think we have to do that. I think we can ask ourselves, we can simply stipulate, what if fire is burning cotton? Is the fire contacting the cotton directly? I say no. Right? The fire is only making contact with a certain limited range of properties of the cotton. No, I don't think the fire is conscious. I'm not a panpsychist. I don't think the fire is conscious, but it doesn't matter if you're conscious or not. That's, why not. that's not what makes it a thing in itself. It's a thing in itself because it's, it is what it is apart from any relation, not just the relation to human thoughts. So there's a, there's a plastic bottle in itself here, presumably, not just because I'm looking at it, but because this touches the table, and, and the bottle and the table do not make contact with the full range of each other's qualities. They oversimplify each other, just like we oversimplify the bottle and the table. Objects do this to each other as well. And I think this is one of the great counterfactual crossroads in the history of philosophy. What if German philosophy at that point, after Kant, had gone in that direction, instead of going in the German idealist direction? The German idealist direction, of course, was to say that you can't think a thing outside thoughts, and therefore there's nothing outside thoughts, and so therefore the noumenon, the thing in itself, is imminent to thoughts, and you get Hegel, finally, where there is no thing in itself external to thoughts. It could have gone the other direction. They could have said instead, uh, Kant was a great genius precisely because of the thing in itself. That was his great insight. He was simply wrong to limit it to human experience as something that is other than human experience. Why, didn't, why isn't the thing in itself there in interactions between objects? And it was quite possible because German philosophy then was dominated by Leibniz before Kant and Wolf, Leibniz's disciple. And Leibniz is very strong on issues like this, interaction between non-human things non-human monads. So um, it, it was possible. And then if that had happened, we wouldn't have had Marx, we wouldn't have had the other stuff in the 19th century, we would have had a totally different Western philosophy of the 19th century and a totally different Western history of the 19th century. It could have happened. So I think the, the history of philosophy is often contingent like that, and that's one of the great moments where it could have gone on a different path. At any rate, I've mentioned now Socrates, Aristotle, uh, but there are several other, and Kant, but there are two other object-oriented traditions that I want to speak highly of. One of them is the tradition of Alfred North Whitehead and Bruno Latour. Uh, Alfred North Whitehead 
uh, did something very brave for his era, the 1920s. And I don't know how much Whitehead has studied in Greece. I presume somewhat. He's just coming back into fashion in the English-speaking world. And he's been in fashion in the French-speaking world for a while now, thanks to Isabel Stengers and Latour. Uh, Whitehead doesn't want to privilege human interaction with things. He says he's pre-Kantian in that respect. Right? That there's interaction between any two actual entities, whether it's a human, whether it's a the bottle with God, or whether it's a puff of smoke with a tree, all of these interactions are on the same level for whiteheads. The human standpoint is not privileged for whiteheads. So he is an object-oriented philosopher in that sense, in advance. The problem is that for whitehead and for Latour, a thing is totally defined by its relations. So they are overminers in, in our terminology. For whitehead, a thing is what it relates to. And a thing is so defined by its relations that it vanishes in the next moment. I am not the same person from one moment to the next to the next to the next. I'm actually a slightly different person continuing in each of those moments because my relations, as I move to the left side, my relations to everybody in the audience changes slightly and therefore a different actual entity, or a different society at least. So uh, the Whitehead Latour tradition is another one I like, but one that is too relational in its outlook. So that brings us to the fourth one, the one that really inspired me the most, and that is the phenomenological tradition. And people don't often think of the phenomenological tradition as a great object-oriented tradition, but I think it's actually the greatest of them, um, and certainly the most contemporary of them in some way. And when I speak of phenomenology here, I'm speaking of Husserl and Heidegger, but I'll go in opposite order chronologically, and I'll start with Heidegger, the student, and talk about Heidegger's tool analysis, which is where I started my thinking. It's where I started my doctoral dissertation. And you probably all remember this, that uh, Whereas for Husserl, for phenomenology, in the classical sense, we simply describe the way things appear to us. We're talking about the phenomenon. As Heidegger points out, in Being in Time, but actually earlier, in his first lecture course in 1919, uh, it's actually a fairly rare case that we are conscious of something in our minds. For, for the most part, we're taking things for granted, using them. So the floor in this theater, none of you were thinking of it until I mentioned it probably. But if it weren't there, we'd all collapse into the basement, we'd be severely injured or killed. We need that ground there. The air in the room, unless you're having an asthma attack or have trouble breathing, you weren't thinking of the air in the room. All of these things are there as a background, which Heidegger calls equipment. Uh, he thinks it's a complete system of equipment so that each piece of equipment gains its meaning from the others. And he thinks that primarily in cases when tools break, they become visible to us. So he already thinks phenomenology is dealing with a, a secondary level of the world. So the primary level is the one where things are reliable, where things are being used, taken for granted. And the most frequent interpretation of this, at least in the United States, I think doesn't go far enough. What they will say is that Heidegger is trying to show us that practical reason comes before theory, or practical reason comes before perception, because we're always using things before we actually look at them. Now, there's a problem with this reading, though, which is that using things isn't really any deeper than looking at them or, or seeing them, if you think about it. The problem Heidegger has with perception and with knowledge is that they abstract from the concrete reality of the thing. So if you make a theory about trees, you're inevitably abstracting from the concrete reality of the tree. There are things in the tree that your theory isn't getting right. Uh, and this is why scientific theories keep failing and have to be revised, because they don't ever quite get the reality right. OK, that's true. And it's true that when I perceive a thing, I'm not seeing its concrete depths. I'm seeing an oversimplified version of it. But the same thing is true when we use a thing, right? So if, if you, let's say you, you see a tree or make a theory about trees, that's going to be more abstract than the real tree. But then if you use the tree, say for shade, or for picking fruits, or for cutting it down for woods, you're also not grasping the tree and its reality. You're oversimplifying it as well. So it's it's not human practice. Human praxis really isn't any deeper than human theory. So that's the first thing I would say about the usual reading of Heidegger. But then you have to push it a step further and say, as I said about Kant, don't objects do this to each other as well? So when the fire burns the cotton, which is a great example from medieval Islamic philosophy, which I, I started to teach a bit in, when I was in Egypt, uh, the, the medieval Islamic philosophers like to talk about fire burning cotton for various reasons, and, and that example comes up a lot. And here again, I will invoke that example to say when the fire burns the cotton, the fire doesn't have access to cotton in itself any more than I do. Whether I'm theorizing about the cotton or just using cotton to make shirts, or whether the fire is burning the cotton, we are all failing to really grasp the reality of the cotton. And it's impossible, we can't do it. 
objects cannot touch each other any more than we can touch objects directly. It's not just because we have consciousness that we fail or a mind that we fail. It's because relation always fails to exhaust its terms. And any Deleuzeans out there should appreciate that. A relation is always external to its terms. Uh, there's always more to the thing than any relation unlocks. Okay, so that's Heidegger. And what we have is a, when, when uh, an object breaks for Heidegger, let's say the hammer breaks, he talks about how the, the hammer becomes present. Well, not exactly. What, what happens is that certain qualities of the hammer become present. But the hammer still remains mysterious to us. It's not as if when the hammer breaks, we suddenly understand it. It's just that we notice that something is there that we didn't notice before. But it remains in the darkness. The hammer remains a thing in itself for us that we cannot grasp. The object withdraws, I would say. That's a Heideggerian term. The object withdraws into the darkness. The qualities of the object come forward. So that's enough Heidegger to get us to the next step. Now I want to talk about Husserl again, because Edmund Husserl, the great founder of phenomenology, I think is usually misunderstood as to what his real insight is. Uh, we mentioned Husserl a moment ago just so that Heidegger could overthrow him. We said Husserl talked about describing things as they appear to consciousness, and Heidegger says, no, that's not the case. There's this hidden level that's deeper than all consciousness. Husserl doesn't say that. Husserl, of course, says that Kant's thing in itself is nonsense, that it makes no sense to think about something that might exist that nobody could perceive. To be means to be able to be perceived, at least in principle, by some conscious observer. So Husserl is, to that extent, an idealist, and many of his defenders don't like it when I say that, but I'm willing to argue to the death that Husserl is an idealist. But there's something more going on in Husserl that people miss. The real key to phenomenology the real key to phenomenology, I would say, is the way that it refuted British empiricism. What is the most characteristic doctrine of British empiricism, especially in Hume? I would say it's the idea that there aren't really objects in perception, there are just bundles of qualities. So David Hume says there's no apple, there's just red and round and spherical and cold and hard and juicy and sweet. All there are are a lot of qualities and they always go together. And so you start forming a habit of saying, oh, this is red, round, juicy, sweet, hard, cold, I'll call it an apple as a kind of nickname. But for Hume, there's nothing called an apple that's over and above those qualities. The apple is simply its qualities. That's British empiricism in a nutshell. This idea that objects are illusions of the senses in some sense. They're illusions of habit. Phenomenology goes in the opposite direction. Phenomenology says the object comes first. And this has rarely been noted, but it's, it's pretty clearly the central insight of the entire movement. The idea that you have direct access to the object and the qualities are derivative of that object. And I can show you an example. I, I turn this bottle around, you're seeing different sides at different times. But as I'm doing this, you're not saying, okay, the bottle now is 97.3% similar to what it was one second ago, and therefore there's a family resemblance, and I will therefore call it the same bottle arbitrarily. No, that's not what you do. You say it's the same bottle, and I'm seeing different sides of it at different times. The object comes first. Maurice Merleau-Ponty, one of the greatest phenomenologists, makes a beautiful uh, example. He says, the black of an ink pen and the black of an executioner's hood are not the same black, even if they're the exact same wavelength of light. Because the color black is inflected by the object to which it belongs. And obviously the color black, if it's on an executioner's hood, is very evil and dark and makes us frightened. And so the black has a scariness that's not there with you have a beautiful black fountain pen that lets you write smoothly. So the object comes first for phenomenology. The qualities come second. So what we have here is we have the central point of object-oriented ontology, which is that there are two splits, two basic splits in the world, not one. And this is very common. There are lots of philosophies that have fourfold structures, starting with, Arist well, starting with Empedocles, air, earth, fire, and water, Aristotle's four causes, Plato's divided line, on up through uh, Bacon, Kant, um, Heidegger, Heidegger's Gefiert. Fourfold structures recur throughout Western and Eastern philosophy. Why? Well, they're not all the same. If you have a fourfold structure, it's almost always the result of two dualisms that cross. What are the two dualisms that cross in Heidegger and phenomenology? Well, the first one's obvious. For Heidegger, there's this dualism between what's hidden, what's veiled, what's in shadow on the one hand, and what is visible directly on the other. That's Heidegger's basic dualism. But then you also have this other one that comes from Husserl, the difference between objects and their qualities or you might even say existence and essence, but objects and qualities is closer to what's going on. And now we have two kinds of objects and two kinds of qualities. 
right? Because they're the kinds that are dark and hidden and inaccessible. These are what I call real objects, like Heidegger's tools. Heidegger's objects you can never access directly, no matter how hard you try. It will always be more than any knowledge we have of it. That's the real realm, the real. And it is split into objects and qualities, right? Because there are, there are real objects, and the real objects are different from each other, which means that their qualities are different. Leibniz said this. Leibniz says monads must have, even though each monad is one, each monad has to have different qualities, otherwise every object would be the same. And then, on the level of appearance, the level of the phenomena, you have the same dualism between objects and their qualities. For example, this. This bottle is not hidden from you. You can see the bottle. It's not withdrawn. This is not a Heideggerian object right now that you're looking at. It's a Husserlian phenomenological object. It's an appearance. But it's different from all of its qualities as you spin the bottle. So there are, there are four things going on. And so object-oriented ontology ultimately comes down to the idea that the relation between objects and their qualities is very loose. Objects and their qualities have a partial relation, but it's not a total relation. And objects can exchange their qualities. This is how changes happen in the worlds. And if you re read my book, The Quadruple Objects, I talk about the four tensions between real objects and sensual qualities, real objects and real qualities, sensual objects and sensual qualities, sensual objects and real qualities, which I define as time, space, essence, and eidos. And I won't get into that here, but you can read the book and find out more about that. The point uh, I want to dwell on here is the one tension between real objects and their sensual qualities. Because that's the one relevant tonight, because that's the one that art deals with primarily. And I want to say that philosophy has more to deal with, more in common with the arts than it does with knowledge. What is it you do when you try to gain knowledge? You're trying to paraphrase an object in terms of its qualities. You're trying to, someone asks you what something is, someone asks you what an electron is. Your job as a scientist, or your job as someone who wants to know about electrons, is to find out as many true properties of electrons as you can. The name electron doesn't play much of a role. It's simply there, almost like a bundle for, for true qualities. Right? That you're, you're learning all that it has a negative charge, and that it jumps in certain orbits according to Bohr, and all these other things we know about electrons, that its mass is very small. Uh, but that's not what artists would do. If an artist created a sculpture called the electron, that is not what artists do. Look at artists in terms of the difference between undermining and overmining that I talked about, and you'll find that artists do neither. Is an artist trying to tell you what their artwork is made of? No. It's not that interesting to know what the painting is, you know, that Picasso's Les Demoiselles d'Avignon is 85% canvas and 14% pigment and 1% dust. Not very interesting, unless you're a Dadaist. Not very interesting. Okay, what else, uh, what about Picasso's Guernica? Okay, again, it's not the pigments in the canvas that it's made of, but it's also not its social meaning, right? If you say the meaning, if you say Picasso's Guernica is a protest against the bombing of Guernica during the Spanish Civil War by the Luftwaffe. Okay, that's true, but that does not exhaust the painting because presumably the painting will continue to be viewed and appreciated centuries from now when no one really knows anything about the Spanish Civil War anymore or about, even about the Luftwaffe. That will be forgotten, but there should still be some aesthetic reality to the painting. And so the, the social, socio-political context of the painting should have some meaning to it, some relevance to it, but it does not exhaust the painting. The painting is something in between those two things, the physical components and the social value of the painting. This is what artists do. Artists create an object that is not reducible in either of those directions. Okay, so now how do we interpret the artwork then in terms of the two kinds of objects and the two kinds of qualities? I want to give you the example of metaphor. And how are we doing on time? We're doing fine? Got another, what, 15 or 20 minutes left? Or? Uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. I'll wrap up then with talking about metaphor. Metaphor is very important for object-oriented onto ontology for the following reason. First of all, it's long been known by literary critics and philosophers that you cannot paraphrase a metaphor. You cannot replace a metaphor by a prose statement any more than you can replace the three-dimensional globe of the Earth by a flat map. There will always be distortion. When you flatten the globe onto a map, you can decide to distort the shape of the countries or the size of the countries. You cannot put a three-dimensional solid onto a flat surface. This is well known. The same is true of metaphor. You cannot say what a metaphor means. And I'll give you an example from Homer, since I'm in Greece, one of the greatest of poets. Uh, the Wine Dark Sea, one of the great metaphors from Homer's poems. The Wine Dark Sea. I challenge you to say what that means. 
It means that the Aegean is just as dark as wine. Well, yeah, it means that, but it means a little more than that. Right? It also, when you call the sea wine dark, you're not just talking about the color. You're also implying that the sea has some of the other qualities of the wine, like drunkenness, danger, oblivion. You're transferring a lot of these qualities of the wine onto the sea. And you can never quite explain what's going on there. This is why uh, there's never a final interpretation of a metaphor or of a poem, because there's no way to translate a metaphor into literal terms. Okay, that's one thing about metaphors. There's another thing, which is that metaphors are not reversible the way literal statements are. So if I say a pen is like a pencil, you, know, you learn something from that statement. Both can be used for writing. They have the same shape. And if I say a pencil is like a pen, that's the same statement, right? I'm, I'm saying the same thing in both cases. Or if I say a, a euro is like, I don't know, what's the exchange rate now? A euro is like how many dollars? Dollar 20? I don't know what it is anymore. A euro is like a dollar and 20 cents, or I can say a dollar is like 87 euro cents. You're learning the same thing in both cases, but it's not a metaphor. When I say wine dark sea, though, that's not the same as saying sea dark wine. That's a different metaphor. If I say wine dark sea, the sea is the subject and it gets wine qualities. If I say sea dark wine, the wine is the subject and gets sea qualities. So something interesting is going on there. The metaphor is aware that an object can be split down the middle between the subject and its qualities, and you're transferring the qualities of one object to another and not the other way around. So we have wine dark sea. OK, so what happens? We have the wine qualities there. The wine qualities are what I would call sensual. They're phenomenal. You have some sense of what the wine qualities are in your mind. But what is this sea that is wine-like? We have no experience of this. This is mysterious. It withdraws in Heidegger's sense. The subject term in the metaphor withdraws to some place where we cannot paraphrase it. The wine dark qualities, however, are somewhat there on the surface for us. We have some sense of what they are. Now, for object-oriented ontology, there are no objects without qualities and no qualities without objects. The two always come as a pair. So how does this metaphor work? If the sea is disappearing from us in the metaphor, but the wine qualities are here, how is that possible? There has to be an object that is supporting the wine qualities. What is that object? It has to be a real object, and that object has withdrawn. There's only one real object still there, and that is me. I, myself, is the reader. I, myself, am the, re the reader perform the sea that has wine dark qualities. And this might sound odd, but what this means is that theater is at the roots of every art. The art requires the theatrical performance of the observer or the beholder. And this is interesting because this contradicts what Kant thinks about the artwork. You know, Kant, Kant says one thing about the arts that object-oriented ontology agrees with, which is that the artwork has to be autonomous. Just to review a little bit of Kant here, Remember that uh, we can use the word formalism for Kant's. Kant uses the word formalism for his ethics. I don't think he uses it anywhere else. Why are Kant's ethics formalistic? Well, because an act is ethical autonomously, regardless of its consequences, right? So it's not an ethical act if you're good because you don't want to go to hell. It's not an ethical act if you're good because you want a good reputation. And it's not an ethical act if you do something nice because you want to have a good conscience and sleep well at night. These may be admirable in their own way, but they are not ethical. For Kant, an act is ethical, of course, when it's done for its own sake, only. Only because it is done out of duty, because it is good in itself, leading to consequences such as the fact that you can never lie under any circumstances. So that's Kant's formalistic ethics. The idea that you separate this subjective ethical sphere from any consequences in the real world. Now, in a way, Kant's aesthetics works the same, because Kant says beauty is here, right? Our judgments of beauty, even though we want them to be universal, the reason they're universal is because we all share the same transcendental faculty of judgments. We can all agree in principle on what is beautiful. We don't agree on what fruit tastes the best or what, what the best color, the nicest, prettiest color is. But if we think something is beautiful, we expect everyone else to agree that it's beautiful. This is Kant's aesthetics in a nutshell. So he gives a kind of autonomy to the artwork just as he gives to the ethical action. And Object-oriented ontology agrees with this because I would agree that we, uh, an artwork cannot be explained, certainly not in terms of its physical pieces, but I would also say an, an artwork cannot be interpreted exhaustively in terms of its socio-political effects or the biography of the artist. This is what formalism means in, in aesthetics, and I would agree with formalism to that extent. But there's a problem with Kant's formalism. The problem is that he's cutting off 
the subjective sphere from the outer worlds. Beauty and even the sublime for Kant are all ha happening here, on this side. Beauty is really in the eye of the beholder for Kant. The interesting thing is that the formalist art critics of the 20th century, especially Clement Greenberg and Michael Fried, flip that around. And they say it's in the object, it's not here. It's in the art object, it's not here. But it doesn't really make a difference. The problem is that both, whichever way you do it, you're cutting off one from the other. You're saying that there's no interaction between this part and this part when it comes to beauty. And this is why Michael Fried, who I assume is read somewhat in, in Greece, he's, he's the, still alive, he's been the dom one of the dominant art critics in the Anglophone world for decades since the 60s. Michael Fried's biggest enemy when it comes to aesthetics is, is the theatrical. He doesn't want any theatricality in the arts. Uh, this, some of this is Kantian. He wants there to be a calm, detached contemplation of the art objects and not some melodramatic response to it. But object-oriented ontology says this is impossible, that art is inherently theatrical because I myself have to replace the object that is missing, that is withdrawn. I myself step in for it. And this is why one of my theories about the arts is that the first artwork, even though the oldest artworks we have are cave paintings, I think the first artwork was a mask because of the necessity for theatrical involvement by the person who's experiencing the artwork. The mask had to be the first artwork, I think. And masks simply are made of fragile materials, and so they don't survive in archaeological uh, digs, whereas cave paintings can. And I, this, this was brought home to me especially clearly when I wore a very frightening mask that I bought for Halloween one year, a zebra mask from Tanzania that I bought at a costume store in Chicago. And it looked like a zebra that had been raised from the dead. It had these black lines around its eyes. It was very frightening. And my parents' dogs became so frightened of this mask. They were barking at me, almost attacking me, even though they knew me. They saw me put the mask on in front of them. And one, the bigger dog jumped up and knocked it off of my face. He was so angered by it. There's some animal response to masks uh, that I think make it the, the first artwork. So theatricality, this is important for object-oriented ontology. And I just want to add that this aspect was also seen about ethics. If you're familiar with Max Scheler's great work on ethics, uh, formalism and ethics, which actually critique of formalism and ethics, what does Scheler say against Kant's ethics? He says Kant's ethics is brilliant. Ethics should not be about rewards and punishments. It should be about things done for their own sake. But he points out that each person in each culture has its own ethical vocation. Ethics is not universal in the sense Kant thinks it is. It requires the human as an ingredient. Uh, you, you may have certain ethical imperatives that others don't because you are from a certain family or you have, um, uh, I as a philosopher have a certain imperative to visit Greece and visit the Acropolis and visit the, the Agora around the bottom uh, that somebody else might not, to give a trivial example. Uh, so already in the, in the case of ethics, this was seen by Shaler, that there's already an attachment between humans and worlds. And I want to give you one more example and then we got about five minutes left maybe. Five minutes? Almost five minutes. Okay, so I'll, I'll okay. Um, now I forgot what I was going to say. What is it? This happens more the older I get. Um, oh, I know what happened. What, the, re the reason this first came to me, speculative realism is supposed to be about, and it is about, the way the world it is apart from humans' access to it. It's supposed to, it pre we presented ourselves originally as an anti-Kantian sort of philosophical movements. That's not quite accurate uh, because we all like certain parts of Kant and dislike others. But uh, in principle, speculative realism was about the world in its own right apart from humans. And then I was giving a lecture at an art conference in France five years ago. And somebody asked me a question that I couldn't answer at first. He asked, what would an artwork without humans be like? Assuming that this is what I want because I want everything without humans. I hate humans. <laughs> Uh, but I, I didn't have an answer to it. I didn't have, it took me a few weeks to think of an answer to it. And then I, re I realized after a few weeks that the question is not applicable because we're not trying to get rid of humans. I don't think there can be an artwork without humans any more than I can think there can be basketball without humans or chess without humans. Uh, I should say that an attempt was made to do art without humans based on, there was, there was a Polish-American artist in New York named Joanna Malinowska and She's probably annoyed because I tell this example about her in almost every lecture where I talk about art. But uh, She read my book, Guerrilla Metaphysics, and she did a show in New York called Time of Guerrilla Metaphysics. So I was very honored by this. It was very early. And one of the pieces she did is she took a uh, portable stereo, we call it a boombox, I don't know what you call it here, and it was solar powered, and she put a CD in there of Glenn Gould playing Bach fugues, 
And then she started walking towards the North Pole as far as she could go. She's a performance artist or a conceptual artist. And she took this boombox playing Bach music as close to the North Pole as she could go, and then she left it on the ice and walked back to New York. So the idea is supposed to be it's object-oriented art because there's this music playing and no one's listening to it. It's, ob it's music without humans listening to it. Now that's not, I mean, it's a, it's a nice idea, but it's not really true because you have to hear about it for it to be an artwork at least, right? To be a piece of conceptual art, a person has to be hearing about it and being amused by it and laugh and say, oh, that's a great idea. Wish I had thought of that. So I don't think you could have an artwork without humans. I think if humans are all killed in a nuclear war or something, a plague, there will not be artworks unless dolphins or monkeys can survive and appreciate this. We don't know. But uh, in other words, humans are a necessary ingredient of artworks, just as we're a necessary ingredient of basketball or chess. It does not follow that artworks are exhausted by what humans think about them. There is still some depth to the artwork that is not exhausted by the fact that we are looking at it. And I'll give you a, another example. Manuel Delanda, I don't know how well he's known in Greece, but probably because since Deleuze is popular here, Delanda is probably popular here. Yeah. Delanda wrote a very interesting book called The New Philosophy of Society. And I think he answers this question decisively on page one. He says, this book is giving a realist philosophy of society, which means what is society really like apart from humans? And he says, you're going to say that's stupid, because how can you have a society apart from humans? Society is made of humans. And he says, of course, yes. But what I mean is, we want to know the way society is apart from human conceptions of it. What is society in itself? Sociology is not finished, right? Sociology has not ever grasped the depths of society, and it probably never will. We'll keep improving in sociology, just like in every science. And so you need to make a distinction between two human roles in the world. Humans can be ingredients of things, and humans can be observers of things. Those are two totally different things. The fact that humans are ingredients of a situation, like artwork, humans are a necessary ingredient of art, just like hydrogen is a necessary ingredient of water, it does not follow that humans exhaustively know what an artwork is. The artwork is that which resists all human explanation, all human paraphrase, and this is something art critics all know. And this is why some of the best writing done by humans is criticism of this kind. Art criticism, architecture criticism, food criticism, wine criticism. You know, there's this great uh, article by Daniel Dennett, great because I don't like the article, but it's, it's a wonderful example. It's the article he wrote called Quining Quelia, some of you might know. Daniel Dennett, a very reductionist American philosopher. He makes fun of a wine taster. He imagines this wine taster drinking a wine and saying, a flamboyant and velvety pinot, but lacking in stamina. And Dennett basically says, isn't this stupid? It's so pretentious. What you need to do is pour the wine in a machine, and it gives you the chemical formula. And my wife, as a food scientist, knows you have to do both. There's chemical analysis and sensory analysis. Uh, but uh, wine critics, you lose something when you get rid of the flamboyant and velvety pinot and replace it with a chemical formula. There's something, some work being done by that poetic description, even though Den Dennett doesn't realize it. Because then it's a dual minor, right? Things are either their physical underpinnings or their functional effects in their environment. But I think some of the best writing ever done by humans is in these realms of criticism, where you have to allude to things. And there's no way to do it but poetically. You can't do wine criticism without having a bit of the poet's spirit in you. You can't do architecture criticism without that, or art criticism, or food criticism. Um, and that risks pretension. You risk pretension when you start speaking poetically. And pretension, I would say, is the professional risk run by the humanities. Embrace that risk. Try not to slip into it. But you run the risk of being pretentious when you are doing good writing in the humanities in a way that you're not in the sciences. You're not going to find a pretentious scientist most of the time. You might find a boring scientist or a dogmatic scientist. But try to find a pretentious physicist. It's not going to happen, because physicists tell you what they know. right? They they tell you what the data supports, what the theories seem to show. Physicists are able to paraphrase their theories. Uh, the humanities, we cannot paraphrase theories. There will never be a final biography of Napoleon the way there, the way there can be a final Higgs theory or something, right? Um, there's something elusive about the object in the humanities. And how do I tie this to philosophy? Well, again, remember Socrates. Socrates is always my favorite example of this. Get, show me one passage in Plato where Socrates succeeds in defining anything. There's no final definition of virtue, of, of justice, of friendship, of love. Socrates never gets to one. Why not? Because it's philosophia. It's not Sophia. He's getting closer. He's only a god could have wisdom, he says. And we need to get back to these Socratic roots in philosophy. Uh, instead of trying to think of philosophy as being a kind of mathematics or a kind of natural science, because that's not what it is. It's dealing with something elusive. So 
I will stop there and take questions if anybody has them, and thank you for listening to me.